Uh, it's six o'clock. I'll call this meeting to order. We always start with the pledge. And I'd like John Webb to lead us tonight. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So this is quite a crowd we've got here. This is a public hearing, um, which the select board, or well, really the town administrator and select board uh, called in relation to the alternative treatment center, which is proposed for Tenney Mountain Highway. And I will scream, <laughs> or at least, and I just as a summary prepared this. New Hampshire has recently passed a statute which permits the sale of marijuana from one location in each of four districts. I know most of you know this already, but some don't. So one of those districts is Coos, Carroll, and Grafton counties, excluding Hanover and Lebanon. The sales are to be restricted to individuals who suffer from diseases and conditions which are pretty clearly defined in the law. New Hampshire's Health and Human Services has chosen Sanctuary ATC to, the, to be the provider in this northern district. Sanctuary is planning to locate on Tenney at the property we have locally known as the Abode property. The town was advised of this plan three or four weeks ago uh, when the ATC folks had a meeting with our town administrator, Paul Freitas, and more or less simultaneously filed an application for a site plan review uh, in front of the planning board. The site plan review will be taken up at a planning board hearing this Thursday. Uh, this is a public hearing. Uh, the purpose is to give Plymouth residents and other community members a chance primarily to hear about this plan and to comment on the plan or to ask questions about it. Uh, representatives of Sanctuary ATC are here tonight as well as uh, representatives of Health and Human Services, I believe, which as I understand it, and they will probably correct me, uh, has the responsibility of implementing this program and to some extent, I believe, uh, regulating its operation. Uh, since this is rather new to most of us, and although the purpose of this is really to solicit public comment, I think it would probably be best to hear from uh, maybe Sanctuary and ATC uh, briefly, and I'm looking at you, Jack, if you're going to talk. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, and I think maybe uh, Sanctuary first. Do you have a few words you'd like to say just to m explain, I guess, what, what we're... It, it's up to you, uh, Chairman, whether you'd like DHHS to speak first and then turn over. Um, I leave it to your discretion. Well, it sounds like that's what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just reading between the lines a little here. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, uh, Thank you, um, Chair Conklin and uh, um, members of the select board and the town administration. Uh, it's very nice to be here with you tonight and I'm uh, happy to see such a great turnout. Uh, you've done a great job of getting the message out to people and we're very pleased to be here on behalf of the department uh, with uh, Sanctuary to talk a little bit about uh, the ATC, Alternative Treatment Center, and answer questions that people might have. Uh, as uh, your chair, Selectman, has uh, pointed out, the legislature passed a uh, therapeutic cannabis uh, statute. I'm trying to speak up. If I'm too loud, let me know. If I'm too soft, let me know. Uh, but the legislature passed a therapeutic cannabis law, which uh, asked for the DHHS in conjunction with and a partnership with the uh, municipality to solicit input uh, from uh, residents, potentially qualifying patients, and designated caregivers uh, as to their comments about the site selection. Uh, the program is a legislative initiative that was passed by statute uh, to provide relief to individuals with very serious medical conditions to allow them legal access to therapeutic cannabis. Uh, in establishing the program, uh, uh, Chair Conklin is correct. It is the responsibility of DHHS to implement this program and to oversee its regulation. And doing this, we have worked very closely with the 
Therapeutic Cannabis Advisory Council, which is a legislative advisory council, and solicited their input as we developed our program and uh, brought it to this stage of implementation. The uh, department uh, is responsible uh, essentially for uh, three major elements. First was the selection of up to four uh, alternative treatment centers, and uh, there are four uh, sites that have been selected that have been provided to three entities. Uh, additionally, the department is uh, charged with the responsibility of accepting applications for qualifying patients. Uh, those are conditions that certifications that are provided by their qual but their uh, physician uh, and, and a person who they've had a, a, a medical relationship with of at least three months. Uh, that indicates that, in fact, they do have one of these very serious medical conditions that the legislature has determined uh, may be eligible for therapeutic cannabis. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we will be issuing the cards and overseeing that, and we'll be uh, providing very close oversight and regulation of the alternative treatment center. Uh, here uh, we have with us Sanctuary ATC, which is the uh, eight alternative treatment center that's been selected for this region of the state. Um, the department uh, has <coughs> two sets of rules that we are using to oversee this program. One is the patient and caregiver rules uh, that are very um, specific and uh, they're on our website. You can look at them if you want to see the details of what kind of a condition may qualify and uh, what uh, requirements designated caregivers are required to uh, uh, um, to go through. Uh, what we're here today about is the alternative treatment center, and we have some very uh, uh, serious and strict uh, rules that we've passed. We took the benefit of being the 23rd state in the country to have such a program, and we looked at what did the other 23 states do so that we weren't going to reinvent the wheel and uh, at the same time pay uh, close uh, attention and homage to our legislative requirements, which are a little different and a little stricter than some of those other states. Um, uh, but once we um, uh, have uh, the program up and running, I, I would say uh, probably around November, we'll start to accept applications in the department for qualifying <coughs> patients. Um, the ATCs uh, meanwhile, with local authority and permissions, we'll be uh, setting up their dispensaries and uh, separate cultivation sites. For Plymouth, it is just the dispensary. The uh, dispensary regulations require very strict advertising. It's going to be very low key, so there isn't going to be a lot of profile or no flashing lights or anything like that. Uh, they have uh, very uh, significant uh, security regulations that they have to comply with and they have had conversations with your police chief and as they're further developing their security protocols they're going to continue to have ongoing conversations with your local uh, law enforcement in addition to the department. Um, once they're up and running the department will continue its oversight and uh, be working uh, uh, to inspect and oversee and make sure that this program is uh, successful in its implementation. So I don't want to speak too long because we really want to make it uh, so that the public and eight and sanctuary can speak. I may not have been paying attention, but did you give us your name? My name is Mary Costelli, and I am the Senior Division Director at Health and Human Services. And with me is a team of individuals from Health and Human Services. I have John Martin. He is uh, my manager in charge of licensing of uh, health care facilities and child care programs. Uh, the commissioner put uh, therapeutic cannabis in licensing because we're used to overseeing inspections of uh, mm. complex health facilities. <coughs> with us is Jake Leone, our public information officer. Rod Bascom, who is uh, overseeing the uh, inspection process for the ATCs. Michael Holt has uh, helped us uh, significantly with our rules for both patient uh, caregivers and uh, the ATCs. And he is also our commissioner's designee 
to the uh, Therapeutic Cannabis Advisory Council. And also with us is Diana Kreitinen, who's a person who works for me in my appeals unit, and I pulled in to help me because we just needed more legal power. So she's been a, a, a tremendous uh, assistance to us as well. So uh, we'd be very happy to answer any questions as you go through this evening. All right, and um, just FYI, we need to have names of everyone who speaks, and for those of you who live in Plymouth or in the, in the surrounding area, would you give us your town of residence as well when you speak? And she kept it to 10 minutes, so that's good. Um, would somebody like to uh, say something on behalf of uh, Sanctuary? Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mike Wilmoth, I'm actually a Northampton resident. I am uh, pleased to thank the town, of Port, the town of Plymouth and the Board of Selectmen for having us tonight. And certainly want to thank DHHS for the absolutely amazing job you guys have done in organizing and implementing this project to date. I know it's had a lot of moving parts and uh, they have done an amazing job. Um, I want to just take a couple minutes to introduce Sanctuary. And I want to do so by telling you a little bit about our mission our, chari our charitable purpose, some information about our security and the dispensary and the setup, because I think that's probably what you guys are going to have questions about. As we, I'll be quick because I want to hear your questions. As you ask questions, we have a, our entire operations team here tonight. We have a number of individuals from our board. So we're ready at, to hopefully help answer your questions and move forward. Sanctuary is a non-profit organization, and we are focused on returning all operational revenue above and beyond those needed to run the organization back to the community and to the citizens of New Hampshire. We're going to do that in several fashions, charitable donations. We're going to be working with your law enforcement, with community education, to help the citizens of New Hampshire understand what opportunities medical marijuana medical cannabis, the medicine it can provide and the relief it can provide to those individuals suffering from specific medical conditions. We're also going to be working to ensure that the citizens of New Hampshire have the opportunity to access medical care. That's a very important part because of that, of the profits from the organization, a specific portion of that as directed by the board will go back to the individuals much like other support programs. There'll be an application process through which they can apply. There's different levels of funding and there will be a, additional funding to help those individuals with medical expenses. So the community support and helping ensure that everyone has access to the medical care is a very important part of what we as an organization stand for. We're a group of compassionate New Hampshire citizens who have really come together to try to find solutions to help people access resources that have not historically been available. It's a uh, great opportunity to both reach out back to the community and educate because really there's a lot of misunderstanding about who is going to be able to access these treatments. It's important for you to know that seizure activity and that there have been relief provided in some situations but that is a decision between the youth, their parents and their medical providers. The department has uh, some provisions to uh, limit the possibility of diversion. First of all, the cannabis is expensive. It's uh, most of the ATCs uh, are going to uh, put a price uh, on it that's going to be similar to the street price. So people, it, it will be some variation uh, taking into account uh, <coughs> uh, poverty conditions, etc. However. Um, because you have to pay out of pocket for an expensive product, it does not, uh, you're not going to make a profit really then by selling it on the street because you're getting, for the most part, a street, uh, a price that's similar to the street. The um, uh, quantity that's allowed, again, was set by our legislature, so that is a provision that our legislature has addressed. Uh, if a uh, person uh, were to allow their product that they have uh, obtained to be diverted, they are, uh, first of all, risking the loss of their card, and that means they would then be 
perhaps revoked from participating in the program and if they have a very serious medical condition they're going to want to be careful about that um, additionally um, uh, they are subject to criminal laws if they're illegally selling <coughs> or providing uh, there's a law enforcement uh, provision that also controls in this situation the uh, ATC sanctuary is going to be working very closely with education and I am sure they're going to work want to work very closely with you on educational resources and the department too would be very interested and hearing whatever additional information that you would like to provide to us on those issues. So we're very glad to partner with you on that. Thank you. Jack. Good evening all. I'm Jack McCormick. I live in Plymouth. Um, I'm a lawyer for Sanctuary. I also have had kids grow up here. Um, I spent half my life in this town. Not dead yet. Half, <laughs> the last half of the life I spent in this town, I should say, the good years. Um, it seems to me that you can never eliminate the potential for diversion. And I say that because the older I get, the more pills I have. In my dresser, any given time, there's a number of bottles. And I think I'm smart about that. But, you know, I, I think about people coming into my house and kids visiting and all that. And I think that personal responsibility is obviously an issue. When you take medications or any medication, there's a responsibility to treat them with respect and responsibility. And this is nothing different. So I suggest that. Um, other than tamper-proof bottles, other than uh, being very careful, educating, you can never totally eliminate that. But again, it's personal responsibility. And there's no greater danger here than, than my prescription from Rite Aid or from CVS. And quite frankly, this is a very, very, very highly scrutinized, highly regulated exercise. And it's a highly secure pharmacy situation these fellows. So I think that we have to take responsibility ourselves. We all agree with what Deb's saying. Absolutely. I've had kids grow up here. I know Deb has. I've defended some of your kids. Uh, <laughs> 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 it worked out pretty well for the most part. Some of us. But the bottom line is we have got to understand that it's our responsibility to watch, to watch what happens. And the last thing we want to do is to increase or create a drug use problem in Plymouth. That's not what these guys are all about. It's highly thought out, regulated, it'll, it'll get better. So my only point is I, I'd like to assure you that diversion of the product is paramount in their mind. Thank you. <clears throat> Others? Yes. Mary. I think I can just shout from here, but uh, my name is Mary Cooney. I'm from Plymouth. I'm the state representative and also on the board of Katie Communities for Alcohol Drug for You. And as my questions really, I was, well, two questions really. I know this product isn't being grown here, but I'd like to know where is it by the same company and what are the controls there. And also knowing that we worked on my committee on the the marijuana bill that would make it recreational and one of the, we studied Colorado and of the many, many, many hundreds of different products that contain marijuana or THC and the edibles and how they're being marketed and so on and I, I believe there's in this bill that nothing can be packaged so that it looks like anything else but I wondered what this center will be saying like are there going to be candies are they going to be soda pop are they going to be brownies are they going to be what we generally term the edible sometimes it's vapors or sometimes it's so i just like to know the range of products that are going to be there and the controls <laughs> somebody want to take that yeah sure well we will have a significant range my name is jason sidman i'm the ceo of sanctuary atc uh, we will have a significant range of products that are offered, everything from flour to edibles to vapor, like you mentioned. And, um, you know, it, every person, every patient is really going to decide on exactly what they want. And just to touch base on the point of the two ounces per 10 days, it's very deceiving. It sounds like a lot, but in reality, when you do a CO2 extraction, which is the type of extraction method we're going to utilize, the amount of cannabinoids or THC or CBDs that actually will come out and be usable will be so such a small minute amount that there are actually some protocol treatments that we won't even be able to do a full therapeutic monthly dose at two ounces every 10 days 
just thought I'd add that in there. If, uh, Thank you, Jason. Good. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to add there is a prohibition in the rules that the uh, cannabis cannot uh, simulate candy or uh, items like that. So that's an additional uh, response that I wanted to provide. Thank you. Mike. Yes, there was another point of that question. Question. Uh, was there? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just pointed out to me. Uh, the representative Cooney also asked, "Where will the cannabis be grown?" All right. Uh, sorry. It will be a separate cultivation site. We are not making the cultivation sites public because that's uh, good to maintain the security of it. But there will be. It will not be in Plymouth, um, and it is not in this county actually. Um, and uh, there's very tight security around the cultivation uh, site as well, uh, multiple security systems uh, to prevent um, uh, improper uh, or security risks as well. I did, just to add to that too, the, uh, the rules that will govern the alternative treatment centers are available on the DHHS website. So if you go to the website, if you click on topics A to Z, click on C for cannabis, that'll get you to the website and you'll find the two rules. The one that you'd want to look at in this regard is HEC 402, which is the rules that govern the alternative treatment centers. The security provisions of that rule govern both the dispensary and the cultivation site. And if you look at that rule, you'll see there's very, very, very extensive security requirements for both the dispensary and the cultivation site. I, Liz, did you? Yes. She had her hand up, but I'll, you um, can be done. I'm Liz Brochu. I'm a Canton resident, and I also work at Katie, and I'm the services coordinator, and I work with Canton Community Services and Canton Health Services. Um, I have three questions. I'm very curious. Um, is there going to be a monitoring program? Because for our prescription, of course, I'm, I'm comparing it to the prescription drugs, but there's a prescription monitor the state. Um, is there going to be a, a monitoring system for those patients to um, not be go seeking out every single um, sensor? Um, that's one. Um, another one is I've heard of very high um, percentages of THC in products, um, as high as 90%. Um, is that necessary for this type of um, treatment. Um, if not, then what is your percentage that it's, it's going to be a restriction? And my third question is why Plymouth? If yes. it's going to be all of North Co Country going up to Coas, why are we doing um, Northern Northern Country <laughs> or Southern Northern Country? That's great. Thank you. Liz, uh, yes, sir. Uh, first of all, with regard to uh, the prescription monitoring, uh, there will a patient may only go to one ATC. They register with the department which of the four they can choose. They can change their dispensary, but they have to change it through the department. And when they go to that uh, particular site, they have to be recognized as a customer of that site. I'm going to leave the concentrate question to sanctuary, and then. Uh, uh, I'm going to touch on why Plymouth, and I'm also going to let uh, Sanctuary to add their response to that as well. Uh, the state was asked to uh, provide geographic diversity uh, for the convenience of uh, qualifying patients as part of our implementation. The way the department went about that was we created four geographic zones, and so we created this zone uh, within the zone. Uh, we allowed uh, considerable latitude and you will hear from Sanctuary that they uh, looked at Plymouth because of where it was on Route 93 and its access to other areas but I'm not going to steal their thunder I'm going to let them explain that to you uh, why they've uh, uh, put, uh, selected Plymouth Just to answer the THC, the high THC question that you had, we will have a variety of products <coughs> that will range in no THC, only certain CBD profiles, to products that also have THC. As far as that goes, um, and it, that's a great question about why we chose Plymouth. Well, we did some extensive modeling 
and we used a similar uh, software similar to something called Buxton Analytics. So we could actually pinpoint a location within our region, our zone, and it would tell us specifically exactly via a 90 minute drive time study, what is the max amount of population of that region we could serve. So that's how we came to this location. And in addition to that, it's also very beneficial that Walmart's right down the street, and that is the most northern Walmart in the state of New Hampshire on 93. And that's also a destination point for a lot of patients. So it would be convenient for them to drive right by and pick up their medicine. Um, and then also Route 93, as we know during the winter months, is probably one of the best maintained highways in the state. And that's the other reason as well. Mike, you want to pick someone? You got oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Carol Houston, I live um, in Plymouth. I'm just wondering if this is a fait complete. Do the citizens have anything to say about it, or is it a done deal? I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd simply offer that the legislature, in its wisdom, passed the bill. Um, frankly, um, the law is intact. It's, it's in fact, it's a mandate given the state to supply medical cannabis to citizens who need it. Not everybody, people who really need it. So to that end, unless the law is repealed, I would suggest that the, the law is there and must be implemented. So to that end, unless the law is repealed, then um, this is going forward. So uh, my... I think he's no. trying to say What yes. I'm trying to say is the, the legal framework is here. In terms of Plymouth itself, um, there are some regulatory discussions to be had, etc. And we think we're very well qualified and belong here, and we fit with zoning and planning. So we think uh, it's the perfect location to have this. We plan to be the best in the state. We want to be the model, the one that does it right. Carol? Carol? If I could just follow up a little bit on that. Um, they require a site plan approval from the planning board and there is a hearing on the site plan application scheduled for this Thursday and it's possible that issues will arise in the course of the site plan review uh, which the, the planning board would take up that isn't really our domain our responsibility or even our business our business today is just to have this public hearing and um, make sure that health and human services and sanctuary knows what the concerns of the local people are but you're uh, of course everybody's welcome to attend the uh, planning board hearing as well yes ma'am hello my name is carol cole i live on 43 pleasant street right among the student population for the most part the interaction is very pleasant however during party time in the season is a very different situation. Current statistics from a report um, from the, uh, excuse me, <coughs> just take a second, I have to look here. Um, the Michigan Medical School did issue a report stating that 51% of college students are currently using marijuana. Current brain research also indicates that the brain, the frontal cortex there, it, that controls judgment, does not fully mature until they're 25. We have a very large college population. Marijuana is readily available in Plymouth. It concerns me that a facility, now I understand you say it's going to be a very secure facility. The laws against marijuana prior to their legalization in some states have been very intense, has not stopped the college kids or any young people from getting marijuana. Therefore, I am concerned. Is Plymouth the best location for this? Mm -hmm. uh, we do have such a large population of students. It's an ever-growing population. I would like to hear some other comments from, from people. I understand that medical marijuana is very beneficial. However, there are extracts from marijuana in pill form that I understand are effective also. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um.
Yes, ma'am. I think you had your hand up next. My name is Forrest Starmer. I'm actually at Forty Pleasant, so I see you every morning. <laughs> um, I was an undergraduate student as well as now I'm a graduate student in clinical mental health counseling. So I've been here for quite a while, and I'm now a resident. Um, I don't plan on ever leaving. It's the best place I've ever been. Um, but coming from a college standpoint, as well as seeing family members who live in other states who have debilitating diseases, where they had or seizures every single day, no medicine helped, and then they finally were able to get an additional marijuana, and no seizures. They can eat now. They can, you know, start to talk now. It's an amazing thing to see. I'm not saying I was always for medicinal marijuana, but after seeing that, you, you literally can't back away from it. Um, in regards to the school, I used to be a community advisor on campus as well. To be honest, I've seen more people prescribe Adderall and selling Adderall than marijuana. Marijuana is the quote unquote starting to be the main drug. Do I say that it's not being used on campus? Of course it is, of course. But everywhere. We have two police departments. What other town has two police departments? Some towns only have one police officer from the time. It's, you know, and going through all of the studies I've seen online, crime rates actually decrease because of the enhanced security. There's security looking outside, so all the robberies at other businesses near the dispensary, they can also see. You know, I just, I mean, I, when I heard about this, I thought, what better place? Because, I mean, we have two police departments. Crime goes down. More business for Plymouth. We all know that in the summer, some businesses really can't handle it. More business. People coming to buy food. People coming to buy gas. Thank you. Know, you got to start somewhere. Thank you. I, Sharon, I think I saw your hand. I, I was just going to say that I understand. Could you uh, just identify? Oh, I'm sorry. Sharon Beatty, State Health Center that's in front of Bristol. Um, as far as researching where to put this facility, Plymouth is certainly on the south end of this region. It is nowhere near centrally located. Mm -hmm. I understand being close to 93, and I get the thing about Walmart. There's a Walmart in Littleton that is far more centrally located than Plymouth. I, I don't, I mean, the belief that the Walmart is only in Plymouth is just not a fact, and I don't have any other comments, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. I saw, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm Lisa Donor. I live at Four Langdon Street. Um, I'm not going to weigh in on the issue of the, the marijuana uses of it, but I'm really concerned about the number of people who will be um, using that facility on a daily basis because that's an extremely busy intersection on an extremely busy street. Mm -hmm. And right now, there is no traffic control on that street other than go if you dare. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is actually to the people that are, are anticipating running this facility, how much traffic do you expect to be going in and out of that parking lot? Uh, because right now it's very difficult to merge on the Penny Mountain Highway with the existing traffic flow. <coughs> Jason? That's a very great point, and that's exactly why we're going to be doing it predominantly by appointment only. And it's mandated by the state that any patient that comes in has <coughs> excuse me, a one-to-one -one relationship, meaning one staff member or one patient. So, for example, if we have three bud tenders, that means only three patients in the facility at once. The parking, re the parking over there, I believe, can hold 16 vehicles, and I don't expect, even with employees, to ever really exceed half of that space. Um, and in regards to the question about the Walmart location, the re geographically, you're right. It's not in the middle of, of Zone 4. However, population density-wise, we can, without question, serve the greatest amount of the population by being located in a zone within a 90-minute drive time study. And that's really what we have to take into consideration, is accessibility for as many patients as close as possible. Paul? Mr. Mohadaria, <coughs> uh, for the sake of the planning board and Carol, she's still here? Is Carol still here? Because we gave Carol an answer, I think the chair from the planning board, or we should explain that the planning board yes. is going to be held to different parameters Thursday night. I wouldn't want Carol to be de deceived or anybody no. else here tonight. Can I just a chance I to talk? So, well, I was going to say the issue of uh, 
parking and traffic volume and traffic control is something that the planning board has to look at in the course of its review Wait, that earlier Carol had a it restricted towards marijuana the planning board won't be debating the use of marijuana or something like that so I wouldn't want anybody to leave feeling they'll get a second chance on Thursday night so I want to make sure that they take an opportunity to, to come get, to the planning board hearing if they to wish get their to. answer to those type of questions to be answered here tonight all right on so marijuana I, and whether they feel it shouldn't be here or here there'll be a different charge for the planning board all right do, do we understand Paul is basically saying that we're here for a public hearing and we're here to discuss what's going to occur if this is approved and you know what the safeguards are the, all these things we've been talking about the planning board's charge is a little bit different they review the site plan application they accept it if it's complete they approve it or disapprove it they may put conditions on it and those kinds of things can be taken up with the planning board on Thursday night it's a little different function okay uh, others yes ma'am I'm, I'm just wondering it seems like this is a dumb deal myself is there going to be any financial advantage to the town of Plymouth having this facility in our backyard, whether we want it or not? Are we going to receive any kind of financial and from the government, from the state? Taxes? Something? Well, I, I believe there was an amendment put on that statute that requires them, even though they're a nonprofit, and even if they were able to convince somebody that they're charitable, to pay. Uh, an equivalent you, you know either a pilot or taxes now I believe the way they've got this thing set up right now is they're going to be leasing it so the owner is not a nonprofit and is is paying taxes and presumably out of the lease payments if they were to purchase the property I believe the statute requires them to pay an amount equal to well either the taxes or an amount equal to what the taxes would be but I, I saw an amendment to that statute, and I don't really know that it was passed. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, it was passed, uh, Chair Conklin. Uh, Senate Bill 54 was passed, and the governor signed it in place. Uh, in true New Hampshire way, although it is a nonprofit charitable organization, they will pay an amount equal to what they would have paid in taxes. So that is a requirement of law. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Ryan Brady. I'm also a uh, president of Pleasant Street. It's nice to see my neighbors. <laughs> um, I have a unique perspective. Um, I've been a resident of Plymouth for four years, going on five now. I lived all on campus uh, with my wife as a residence director um, for the past four years. And having recently moved off campus, um, I, I think that the perspective um, that most people have in the town people are worried about the college population. But I'd like to redirect um, that thought process towards the benefits that this will have for the um, patients that currently aren't receiving treatment. Um, because I am also the uh, chair of Relay for Life, while, uh, which is supported by the American Cancer Society for the university. While the American Cancer Society does not condone medical marijuana, and they are not opponents uh, specifically, and they have spoken out towards it. Um, I do have the opportunity to work with patients in our uh, community and I do raise funds for them on their behalf as um, and for their caregivers so they can seek treatment. And this is a benefit to them that they have been asking for and have been lobbying for it for their representatives for a long period of time. So having said that, um, I do have a question for Sanctuary, um, a two-part question. Um, they mentioned that caregivers um, will be employed there to, um, or blood tenders, I believe the term was just passed up. Um, so specifically, how many um, employees will be in the facility, and are they state licensed? Uh, where does the process for hiring? And also, um, Sanctuary mentioned that the funds are uh, based for nonprofit services outside of operating costs. So where do those funds go from uh, the proceeds of their sales? All right. Question. Nice question, Jason. Um, so I guess I'll address the charitable portion first, the, the second part of your question. Um, we are a nonprofit organization, so any funds in excess of operating expenses will go back to the community. And like mentioned, uh, like, yeah, Mike mentioned there, um, not only will it be, uh, res there's going to be a fund set aside that will be directed by the board that will only be reserved for patients. It will also be reserved for people who do not seek medical cannabis treatment 
and have trouble paying their medical bills and things of that nature. That's just one aspect. And then Paul Friedis actually gave us some pretty good um, nonprofit organizations within the community that I reached out to earlier today, actually, that I think we're going to try to set something up and get involved with that as well. And as far as how many employees will be at the dispensary, I'm going to say between five to, to ten over time. It's going to start slow and obviously ramp up as more patients come on board. And just to clarify, we don't hire caregivers. Caregivers is a separate program, and those are for individuals um, that are in need that can't come to our facility that are beyond a 60 minute, uh, 60 mile drive time. So, um, as far as that goes, we'll hire bud tenders. We'll have a facility manager. We'll have a charity uh, manager, basically and myself will be there all the time, and Dr. Cyrek as well. Although it's not mandated by the state to have an on-staff medical doctor, he is a medical doctor and he's our medical director and he'll be there consulting with patients on different strains and cannabinoid profiles that are appropriate for their uh, ailment. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, my name is Ken Little. I am not a resident uh, for uh, Plymouth, but I did want to, I come from Maine. I have property here in New Hampshire. I don't know if that disqualifies me from offering some uh, input to you. We'll take that into account. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from the other side. <laughs> this is primarily directed to the residents here. Uh, so I, in the board too, but mostly to the residents. I want to introduce you to three people that I have personal experience with. I am Ron. I'm 61 years old. I have prostate cancer. Four years and nine months ago, I was told to get my affairs in order. The prognosis was that I had not more than six months. I began a regimen of cannabis use, including a cannabis concentrate called Rick Simpson oil. In four years and three months, in the four, four years and three months that Canvas has given me, I was able to see my youngest daughter graduate from college. I was able to see my son get married to a beautiful woman, and I was able to see my third grandchild born. That gift of time is without price, and I'm 61 years old. I'm Dorothy. I'm 87 years old. I had polio for most of my adult life. I had colon cancer and recently discovered lung cancer. I am homebound. I returned to New England to die in the place where I grew up. My granddaughters at my granddaughter's surgery. I began using Rick The tumors have stopped growing. And hopefully someday they may disappear. Today I can look beyond six months with some hope. I'm 87 years old. I am Susan. I'm 42 years old. I suffer from PTSD. My nights are filled with nightmares, reliving the trauma that I experienced. Every night I fought to go to sleep, fought going to sleep. My life became a living hell. Today, I use cannabis in the evening before bedtime. It helps me sleep without the horrors. I can function during the day, and every day I get a little bit better. I'm 42 years old. Ladies and gentlemen, these are actual patients in Maine I, that participate in the medical cannabis program there. These patients aren't young people. They aren't seeking to get high. They are functioning adults now in our communities. They have families, jobs, and a life to celebrate. So as you consider your AT this ATC in your community, think about those people. Think about those patients that you're going to be helping. Because this is going to be a problem wherever we go wherever the ATC wants to go, not in my backyard. I suggest to you that Plymouth step up and say, yeah, in my backyard. 
Thank you. All right, others? Yes, ma'am. And sir, I appreciate, I truly appreciate your passion, um, speech for lack of a better word. I would like to say that I'm not here to discuss the merits of medical marijuana. There are certainly um, many people who benefit from it. I do have to say my concern as a parent of teenagers is diversion. It will happen. We know it will happen. It has happened. That's it. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is James Papisi. I'm the resident of Potomac. Um, I see about three things that are sort of, there's a fear, okay? We have three places that distribute drugs. Walmart, CBS, and Rite Aid. Those drugs get degraded. Jack said it great. I'm a grandparent. Grandchildren get their drugs through their closets, you have to be responsible that way. Air water, the distribution system is just different. That's the problem we're having here. It's not Pfizer, all right? It's whoever's producing the product and selling it in a different manner, okay? Um, that's what's a very concerning to people. It's a legitimate concern. And finally, my personal stories are of parents, um, one who's alive now and one who's dead. Um, my father had prostate cancer. Um, he was on all sorts of drugs. And towards the end, they put him on morphine. Okay? And he became no longer my father. And I wanted him to try it. I was, I'd go to jail. I'd go to jail if I could get him back, get him that moment of time. Okay? And there's things that the, the illicit use of, of the drug are known, as, which is appetite. Um, a little analgesic effect. Whether it, would, it wasn't a terrible problem, he was going to die. But I would have been able to talk to him, all right, and, and help him through his end of his life. And instead, he had very powerful drugs that were available on the street, quote unquote, legally through legal sources, all right? This is really no different. So I don't want the fear of everybody to, to be here. I have a mother now, and there's people in here in this room that I know have treated her. And she is um, 92 years old. Um, she is on some very heavy duty Oxycontin and whatnot. It's hard to keep. I'm dealing with a, a people in this room as well as a professional from Garden. I mean, Dr. Punziulo. If anybody wants to look on YouTube, he's sort of the clearinghouse of narcotics in the state as far as he has means to test people, all right, like through urinalysis and blood work. If they come in, they need narcotics and they don't pass. They don't get. But the people that are getting, he believes that we have to stop paying. Okay? I'm living with a mother who has spinal stenosis. I'm actually no longer living with my mother who has spinal stenosis. Um, and the drugs they give her are very powerful. And it changes your personality. Um, it really is, is very difficult to watch and deal with it every day. Um, it, it, it's, it's rather sad, actually. And if this was an option that could help my mother, okay, but, but that generation is stigmatized, you know, it's the World War II generation, that it's illegal, I'm not doing it, okay? That stigma should be gone, it should be used as a tool, okay? It should be used as a tool to help people through their pain and suffering, um, as well as, you know, it, it's not as debilitating as some of these narcotics. And these narcotics get on the street, Okay, I'm sorry, we have a different way. We at least have a problem. We as a, as a culture have a problem um, with substance abuse. We have, we have to look at ourselves, take the responsibility. We hit drugs on my mother because she tried to get me at times. Um, you must have not watched them But, um, you know, the bottom line is you've got to be responsible. And it's not just for yourself, it's for everybody, the people around you. Um, so, to me, the medical the issue of medical use of marijuana is simply a tool. And it's a developing tool where I think you can say distribution is different, so it makes people nervous. Don't be nervous. Okay. It, 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 the, it, what they're doing now in other states, if, if you watch like 60 minutes or so, every plant has a UPC code. 
I mean, that's, I'm not even talking whether it's medical or recreational use. They, they track them. You have to be that meticulous about it in a new and developing drug use or drug therapy because it's not going through a pharmacy, all right? It's going through a different means. So we're uncomfortable, understandably why. Nobody wants the kids smoking pot and being, you know, brain dead. It's not good for you. It's a bad thing. But there are applications that are not bad. And we need to have some humanity about this. It's really important. Don't be afraid. It's nothing to be afraid of. We just have to get the job right. And the people who are doing it have to get the job right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Claire Moorhead. I'm a sports president, but I also work with Katie here in Plymouth. And I have a couple of questions, actually eight questions and a couple of comments. Um, kind of touching back on some of the things that were said earlier, both the traffic concerns. Um, one of the big issues that I see, I write about it for Katie all the time, drunk driving is becoming a huge issue in our society. And if you're dispensing this, I guess my question is, are people going to be consuming this at this location? And if so, will they be driving? My understanding is that's still illegal. And so any other medication that you take or you go for a procedure at a hospital, you're required to bring a driver with you if you're going to be under any heavy narcotics. Is that going to be policy there? Um, so that's my question. And also going back to um, the comment about how it affects other communities. Yes, Plymouth has two police departments. I live in a town that doesn't even have 24 hour a day coverage. There are a lot of communities within this geographical region that you're talking about that don't have full time police departments. <coughs> you're looking at um, infrastructure issues. As someone just said, diversion is gonna happen. We know it's gonna happen. It's happening everywhere. We have a drug problem in the state, period. We can't even handle that one right now. And you're going to be putting extra strain on police departments, your medical facilities, not to mention your mental health facilities, that we are already stretched and can't handle. Thank you. you going to take oh, just to address that. Um, first off, there'll be absolutely no consumption on the premises, no question about it. I can definitely assure you of that. And in fact, the law does specifically does not allow that. Okay. And the, I know it was a comment, but I think I can address it, and that is, um, you know, we're really talking about medical cannabis here. And I think sometimes people get a little bit off track and start talking about recreational marijuana use. That's not what we're here about. We're a very highly regulated industry, and just because we're new to the state, we're not reinventing the wheel here. The Department of Health and Human Services has done an extensive work in rulemaking and being part of the legislative process, and they've actually visited other dispensaries and other cultivation centers. They're really good, and they know what they're doing. And we've done a tremendous amount of homework and uh, I can assure you that nothing, again, will be consumed on the property. And uh, also that this is strictly about medical cannabis. And there's very strict uses for it. And the qualifying conditions are very clear. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Yes, Ms. Cooney. Thank you. Representative yes. Cooney, excuse Thank me. You. I have one more question. In Colorado, one of the big problems is it's all the marijuana is a cash business. Will this be a cash business too? Um, it does not have to be a cash business, and I'll let uh, Sanctuary talk about their protocols. Um, at the present moment, it is true that there are some banking issues. Um, all the dispensaries <laughs> in the cultivation site. I, and cultivation sites, the, um, the, the groups chosen to run this and steward this program all use the same bank, which is not located in the state. Um, however, money will be transported via Brinks or armored vehicles. And um, in addition to that, they are working diligently on using ATM cards and things of that nature. So it's quite possible by the time that we're even open that we will be able to accept ATM cards. And, and another uh, 
ATCs, debit cards, are uh, commonly used. And in speaking with the various ATCs here in New Hampshire, they do have relationships with banks. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, my name is Molly Brown. Um, I live in Wentworth, and I'm 16. Um, other than tonight, do you have any other plans on how to educate the area about what this dispensary is about? I'm just concerned about the way youth are really going to pursue this. I can almost guarantee they're not. I mean, you don't see any here tonight, but. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, Jason, do you want to address that? Absolutely. Um, we're going to hold and we're going to have our own education sessions and we're going to have a ton of literature available it will also be available on our website it's two physicians that would need to write a recommendation to the state then it has to be approved by the state and then that's how a therapeutic <coughs> cannabis card will be issued hey jason yes I, her question was a little different though and it, it I, it's something i hadn't really thought of before but she's thinking all the kids in the area are going to be driving by the weed store you know what are they going to think I oh, guess that's kind of what she was. I definitely refrain from the weed store. <laughs> but, uh, it is medical cannabis, and that is true that they will be driving by, but they won't be allowed to enter our facility. It will be locked, and only access will be available to patients. And we'll be having correspondence with the DHHS. They produce a list when they first uh, issue an ID card. And just to mention, if the ID card is good up to one year, but the physician could write it for one week. So, and see how the treatments work out and stuff like that. So it's really not uh, a long-term five-year card. You can pass it off to your friends. It's just not going to work like that. Uh, uh, also, um, again, no advertising. It's a very low-key uh, environment in the building. Uh, when uh, the state went and viewed a uh, dispensary and a cultivation uh, site in Connecticut, it was very nondescript. You would not even know uh, that there was uh, a dispensary there. Uh, it was a very quiet environment. Um, and with the lack of uh, advertising external, it should not make an uh, impression to the community uh, that are in that area. There was nothing outside the facility that in <coughs> any way suggested that there was a connection with cannabis there. It could have been a yoga studio for all you would know as you were driving by it. You know, actually, the liquor store is a big sign. It attract more attention. Yes. Uh, Deb Nero. Could I follow up on that? Uh, perception of risk is uh, something that is, can be a um, send mixed messages. Uh, and, and this is what we've seen is, uh, with prescription drugs. Youth have perceived um, prescription drugs to be harmless because they're prescribed by a doctor. So they must be good for, you, for me. That's, so if I take them non-medically, that's not a problem. That's a big challenge that prevention has in the field, not only just in New, in New Hampshire, but across the country. And that, the, that problem has escalated to a huge surge of use anyway. And it's sowing the seeds of addiction. So any, any help that we can have from you to work together to um, make sure that we maintain a high perception of risk and that, that's isolated to, to the community um, that, that we've been discussing here tonight, um, that's going to be very helpful in, in prevention. I see, yes, sir. <clears throat> My name is Joe Ebner and I'm a resident of Plymouth. I'm also a physician in town and I'm the Vice President of Medical Affairs at Spear Hospital. Um, I can't speak on behalf of all the medical staff in the community, but I don't think there is support of medical marijuana because the medical literature is pretty weak on its um, efficacy. I think the difference between medical marijuana and um, Mr. Puglisi mentioned before, narcotic drugs, but those are FDA approved. Medical marijuana is not FDA approved. So I think that's probably the biggest difference why there is concern is that yes, you can abuse other drugs that are prescribed, but they've been studied rigorously and our federal laws have said that they are approved for certain indications and I have not seen that for medical marijuana. Um, the other thing I can tell you from the perspective of the hospital is that we will not be prescribing this for patients that get admitted uh, or 
whatnot. However, we will have to certainly understand how this could impact someone's medical conditions for medications that we are prescribing. The other concern I have, um, and I'll leave it with a question, is uh, all of us who practice medicine or who um, participate in Medicare um, have to abide by the CMS conditions of participation, which is Medicare, and marijuana is illegal. So we're kind of put in a bind on being able to prescribe something that's illegal. Um, and so I guess my question is, who makes the determination at the Department of Health and Human Services about who is a candidate to get the card and the medical oversight at the dispensary is a question I have. Um, and I'm also under the understanding, I'd like some clarification, that uh, you don't need a prescription for this, uh, simply that you have a designated primary care provider and that you have a medical condition. So I guess those are my questions and concerns. Mary? Uh, so that is correct. Uh, the physician does not prescribe it because it's illegal federally, but the prescription, uh, pardon me, the certification occurs from the treating physician who has a three-month relationship uh, with the client, and the physician, or, or ARNP, uh, indicates that the uh, patient has a qualifying condition which is designated by, designated by statutes a uh, very limited, severe condition, medical condition, plus a symptom. So that's a, a, a higher standard in New Hampshire uh, than any other place. And uh, so that is a legal process. The uh, certification application comes into the department. The department reviews it to see if it has been uh, done properly and certified by uh, a, um, an, a New Hampshire physician or New Hampshire uh, ARNPRN. So uh, that is the process by which the department uh, handles uh, the certification process. Is that uh, that point in time? Follow question. Will that, provide, will that patient be under the care of DHHS for any complications or side effects or problems that might The uh, department does not take over the medical relationship that the individual has with their own physician. That's a very personal and private relationship, and that belongs between uh, those entities. And so, and the physician or nurse practitioner then who has a better relationship with that patient than DHHS feels it's not the best interest. Will that be will that decision not to recommend medical marijuana be supported for among the medical colleagues? The uh, certification has to be signed by a uh, physician or uh, APRN that has a three-month relationship that certifies that the individual uh, does indeed have qualifying conditions. So it comes in via that medical route. The department does not make the determination about the patient. The physician makes the designate, or APRN makes the uh, designation and provides that information to the state, who then uh, looks over it and confirms to see that those are uh, properly uh, completed and following the requirements of our statute. The other thing I will note, and uh, really the department uh, has not uh, weighed into the philosophy of it. That was a legislative determination that was made. But I will say, being the 20th, try and seek this relief if they do have a very serious condition like cancer or a wasting condition uh, or something, uh, you know, uncontrolled epilepsy, that sort of thing. And so that decision has been made by our legislature with the role of a physician or APRN. So if I can ask for a clarification then. So if as a provider you feel that the patient has a medical condition that may benefit from medical marijuana and a symptom that may be relieved by medical marijuana, but feels that that patient might be in a psychosocial situation in their family, that it would not, that the risk would be too great, what recourse would the provider have to say, don't feel comfortable certifying? The uh, physician is not required to sign the certificate. That is a relationship between the physician and the patient. So if the physician is uncomfortable for some reason and signing the certificate, they are not required to do so. Is there any avenue if they are concerned about that, that they could give that information to DHHS because patients will drive around the state to find someone that knows them less to find such a certification. That's my concern. So we're not setting up patient records and tracking them in the state. That would not be uh, a good use of DHHS's oversight. However, the way the legislature 
has protected this uh, process and relationship is, and, and it is unlike some other states, it has that additional higher bar, is the individual must have a three-month relationship with the physician or APRN. And th in that regard, unlike California, <coughs> where you might go to a, you know, a clinic where you don't have a relationship, that is not possible in New Hampshire. May, Mary, may I uh, just ask sort of a follow-up too for clarification? So, the the doctor does not actually prescribe this <coughs> uh, medicine. The doctor simply certifies that the person has the disease or the condition and the symptom, and that's it. And th does that then protect the doctor from liability or problems with their DEA license or whatever they uh, have? That's true, and it's uh, really uh, across the country, really, because it's illegal. Uh, that you don't want the law does not require a physician to prescribe because it's not a it's not a legal medication. So the doctor certifies that the uh, patient has uh, both one of the listed very severe conditions plus one of the designated symptoms that the legislature has specified sort of a, just a, a means by which to circumvent the federal law, essentially, I guess, right? Uh, well, I... You could put it that way. I would not characterize it quite like that. I would say the legislature uh, has considered uh, how it wants to address uh, this evolving area, and uh, that is uh, the wisdom of our legislature mm -hmm. in policymaking. I, can I ask you... Well, no. This is a public hearing. Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the uh, federal government, of course, we cannot speak for the federal government. The federal government uh, has uh, seen the development of this program across the country. And in states in which it is uh, carefully regulated, which uh, it is indeed very carefully regulated in New Hampshire, the federal <coughs> government has not uh, intervened. And uh, in our own state statutes, we have a number of immunities from uh, federal prosecution, uh, from, pardon me, from state prosecution for the ATC, for the patient, for the caregiver, and for the laboratories <coughs> who are testing the product to make sure uh, that it is uh, free of pesticides. I'd be glad to take that up with you separately and provide you with the 23 states. I have, our, our department has copies of there is statute, and I. Uh, but it's also the about federal prosecution. Obviously, there's a liable for prosecution. So, the federal government has obviously changed very drastically depending on what the administration is. Currently, now I believe it's about that. I think that's pretty much I do think it's a, an evolving area of uh, law and practice across the country, and New Hampshire is not as carefully considered in passing this law. Uh, Jack? I'd like to add that from my perspective, this is a state's rights issue. And our state has chosen to put the welfare of its people ahead of federal fear. So I suggest to you, it's typical New Hampshire. It's state's rights, and, and we are the 23rd state to do this, but it's putting our people's welfare ahead of fear of federal prosecution. We're, I think you had your hand up first. Uh, if <laughs> yes, sir. Citizen of New Hampshire. What's your name, sir? Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to know if uh, a general practitioner can issue prescriptions for a specific ailment, or would it have to be a specialist? It does not require a specialist. Legislative intent. Yes, sir. I. You, Oh, you're not a sir, but <laughs> <laughs> I had a, yeah, go ahead. Uh, my name's Maureen Ebner. I'm a resident of Plymouth, and I'd like to know if the ATC will work specifically with us on a very specific list of what types of edibles and vapors will be provided. Have access to this. Oh, they will? Okay, sure. Well, we can't, can, they're a, we can't control illegal activity. No, but what so I'm asking is that you give us, Folks. You give us information so that we can handle it. We don't know oh. what we're looking for absolutely. right now, but we need to know. Absolutely. We absolutely can, and I believe we'll even have a lot of information on our website, which will be updated periodically when new products come online. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Maureen. Um, I think this, we haven't heard from you, and I think you were next, yeah. Can you? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I'm a Clement College student, uh, social work major, and I wanted to ask you about the kids, and I clearly have my stuff together, and being a college student, I'm surrounded by kids constantly. You know, I'm with them. And I, I have seen way more activity on prescription drug selling. Somebody who I've had Lyme disease my entire life. I have chronic pain. I grow up constantly. Dry heave. I, I can't eat a lot. I was prescribed prescription Percocets, other pain pills. They make me sick. They make me throw up because my body can't handle them. Mm -hmm. And that's the point of weed. You know, or marijuana or whatever. It's just, it's, oh, alcohol is so much more addictive and worse for your body than any, I know that that doesn't really, I'm not using specific statistical it's facts, okay. but you could look that up somewhere, and I'm speaking from experience, and I have friends with epilepsy who, like someone else had mentioned before, it's the only way she stops seizing sometimes. She has to take the, the liquid, marijuana that's more concentrated in it. The thing about strains is they are specific to your issue. I have I have chronic stomach problems and stuff, and that would be a specific strain that has a specific amount of a certain type of chemical that makes that, that's the whole point of this being a medical thing. People get confused with street drugs. I mean, if you think about it, technically, I'm not prescribed with marijuana, or I know people who are not prescribed marijuana with chronic illnesses that may or may not, you know, mm -hmm. take that because they can't take prescription drugs. It, it doesn't help them. You know, I can even take Advil. It makes me sick. That's it. So I just wanted to give a college. I, I get A's and B's. I am a good student. I go to a youth center. I'm like, <laughs> not So you're sp crazy. speaking in favor? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Nora Doyle. I am 17 years old. I'm a Plymouth resident. Um, I just want to share my comments about diversion because I think that is a very serious issue. I work at Frosty Scoops. It is a collaboration between the Communities for Alcohol and Drug Free Youth and the Common Man Family of Restaurants. We once had a customer ask us if we sell pot. Obviously, we don't. We're a collaboration with Katie. <laughs> However, <laughs> I'm frightened about the fact that there will be a dispensary in Plymouth because even though you have so many security measures in place, and I commend you for that, you even said it's not going to be advertised, it's just going to look like a yoga studio. This is a small town. <laughs> people know what's going on, word gets around, and people are clever. There's always going to be a way to break the law. and. The fact, um, what I'm going to say is that a person who is, when their brain is being messed up by chemicals, they're even more clever. And I just wanted to share that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Very well said. Yes, sir. Now, I don't know, these Mainers, yeah, I, we were patient to first make it quick, okay? I'm a, totally, like the version at the ATC, I think it's going to be extremely difficult because the ATC is going to be required from the DHHS to correct me on this. As I understand the law, the ATC has to define where every gram of the marijuana plant goes. The problem is the version is going to occur in your homes. And that you cannot legislate or regulate. That's a self, that's your own responsibility. That's your responsibility as a patient. It's your responsibility if you have codeine cough medicine and you don't leave it in the count, you don't leave it on the counter for some kid to pick up your seven-year-old, pick up and drink a bottle of it because it tastes like cherry. The problem isn't with the ATCs. The problem isn't with the medical cannabis. The problem is with the adults that don't lock the medicine up. 
We have the same problem over in Maine. Same discussion. And it always comes down to individual responsibility. You're not going to be able to legislate individual responsibility. You just can't do it. Thank you. Thank you. Others? Yes, I see a hand. Yeah, um, my name is Dennis Ack. I live down in uh, Fremont. I'm a cancer survivor, and I've, one of the original activists has started and worked throughout this entire process to get this uh, legislation passed. Uh, last November, I, I proposed in, um, a dispensary down in Epic. Now, at that point, we hit a brick wall. Um, we found widespread support for the people of the town, but we hit some um, roadblocks in the government. Um, Things have changed, even just since from, from November to now. People are taking this more seriously. Uh, but I just want to let you know that uh, what I'm doing now is I'm, in, I'm involved in a group called Patient Caregiver Alliance of, of New Hampshire. What we're doing is we're uh, it's a 501c3 educational foundation that's going to be working with all the stakeholders involved to provide education and fill in the gaps in the, in the um, program where a 501c3 uh, can, can be of assistance. Uh, mainly like um, the doctor over here has a lot of very important valid issues. I've already started reaching out to doctors and talking to them and, and uh, seeing how we can provide more information. This is a climate of fear that is very palpable. We're trying to work through that. Um, so I just want to let people know that we are, there's groups that are forming that are going to help try to uh, do this. None of us want diversion. None of us want this, uh, the program to be abused. That's something that we're all going to work together to try to solve. And so please do have the confidence that this is there's a lot of smart people, a lot of good people working to help this program succeed. All right, thank you. Thank you. Others? Yes, ma'am. I just do tell I'm a resident of Connect and the director of the Penny Center. And I do want to say um, just how powerful and inspiring it is to be in this room of residents, um, how grateful I am to be a part of this beautiful community who comes together and has um, this kind of discussion. So I thank everybody for being here. I do want to know specifically, you know, we talked a little bit, Deb um, talked about this, Molly talked about this, in terms of perception of risk for our youth. Um, and what specific ways would you help us advocate and educate, um, give our youth the tools that they need to have um, so that they understand the risks. Um, how can you help us, the people on the front lines working with our young people, and giving us the tools we need to educate them? Thank you, Jess. Somebody want to address that? Jason, Actually, uh, Pen the Penn Youth Center was one of the places that Paul had mentioned that we could turn to for charitable donations. So. We're absolutely going to work with every agency and every group and every charitable organization that we can to educate people to the best of our ability. And any questions will be able to field. And the DHHS is also here to answer any questions uh, via email or phone. And we'll do whatever we can to make it a, a good experience for everybody. Thank you, Jason. Um, Yes, I see a hand in the back there. Hi, Katie Doyle again. I just have one other thing to add to this whole issue of diversion. And yes, we do understand that it's the responsibility of the people who have the medical marijuana or who have the oxycodone. We also know that not every parent is vigilant. We also know that not every parent who may be under the influence isn't vigilant. That's where the concern comes from. Again, I, I understand that there may be some validity to medical marijuana. I don't know. I don't know the research. But there are a lot of people to be negligent as far as this is concerned. I, I wish it were different. I see it. I've been a speech pathologist for 32 years. I've worked with a lot of different populations. And I think that it's a reality that cannot be ignored. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. Uh, Barry Sounder of Gamp for Plymouth. Um, and again, I totally understand that. Like I said, coming from the CA, you know, the amount of times we've caught people under the age drinking, um, using marijuana, um, selling Adderall, in fact, um, it's, it's, 
people, the, the parents that you're talking about who aren't visual, who are, you know, possibly drunk or not actually taking care of their children, that is why we have laws in place in the state of New Hampshire. I'm also a CASA, court appointed special advocate for abuse and neglected children. Many of my children that I have represented, you know, their parents are drunk all the time. Their parents aren't locking up their medicines. And we, we, you know, take them out of the home. So we have stuff in place, you know, it's just like alcohol. You know, we have to be responsible with what we're doing. If we're a parent, we need to be responsible because we are raising the future parents. So I think that's, you know, it's like any other substance or um, drug that's out there right now. It's legal. We as parents need to identify how to be a parent and how to do it well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yes. Yes, sir. No, Frank Miller. Oh, Frank, I didn't even see you there. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, uh, it seems that like the 23 states that are in putting in place a system for medical marijuana that hasn't gone through the FDA process, are these states asking the FDA and the government recognizing that there seems to be or has the appearance that there's some value to medical marijuana why it hasn't gone through the FDA uh, type of review so we have a standardized product that could be on through the medical or the dispensary systems as a normal as a normal uh, prescription drug uh, is there anything from the states going up to the federal government requesting a look see on this? I can't really speak to uh, what the federal government uh, is considering. Uh, we all know that it is uh, a changing uh, area and there is um, more openness uh, to uh, the states doing this, uh, particularly if they do it in a careful and regulated manner. Um, with respect to um, standardization of, of the actual product, uh, we do require testing of each batch to see what its cannabinoid profile is, and the products are to be labeled so that the co consumer, uh, the qualified patient, uh, knows what they're purchasing. And then they'll be working with the ATC uh, regarding what, uh, may, what may be the best product for them once they get there. And uh, one hopes, too, that there's a, a physician involved that certified the individual, that they're going to have ongoing relationships with their physician about what is successful and not successful. And I'm sure that our advisory council will also be taking a look to see what happens uh, as we go forward. And indeed, the uh, legislature has um, uh, set a period for which it will review uh, the successfulness or lack thereof of this program, and I believe that is uh, in a four-year period. Am I correct about that? Four five years? Five, five. five. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Five years. So. Mary, uh, what he asked was, are you aware of any effort on the part of the states to discuss this in some form with the feds? I, I really can't speak to those uh, federal conversations. I'm just not informed enough about that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what is the justification for having edible marijuana? And that's something that I really don't understand. And because it's something that's for children, I don't understand why it has to taste good if it's not for children. Um, that's a very big concern of mine. And I think it's actually pretty ridiculous that it exists. So the, um, I'll let Sanctuary speak to that, but each method of imbibing uh, the cannabis has a different impact on the body. So for example, uh, if cannabis is smoked, it's, um, it goes into the body more quickly. If it's uh, eaten, uh, it reaches its um, blood levels much more slowly, but then is sustained for a longer period of time. So depending upon what medical condition an individual has, they may be interested in a different kind of product. And I'm going to turn that over to uh, Sanctuary. Yeah. Uh, well, basically, the part of the reason why we really need to make all offerings available is because take, a, for example, a patient that may have lung cancer and they can't inhale. 
and they have difficulty inhaling, um, they could maybe have a piece of a brownie or or something. I'm just using that as an example. That's, a piece. That's my question, why yeah. is it a brownie? And, not and no, it, you're right. It doesn't. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we we do want it. We one at a time. Yeah. Why? Is it? Well, no, no. This is for this is for a qualified medical condition. This isn't for entertainment. So, but we are mandated to have cannabis infused products that could be in the form of a salve. It could actually be in the form of a patch that's time released throughout the day. So a patient could put a patch on their leg and they wouldn't have to eat anything. And they wouldn't have to smoke anything either. There's a lot, there's many. Well, no, I didn't, I, I didn't say candy, but there's going to be edibles and there's also going to be, we're working on the patches. And as the industry evolves, there'll be more and better and more efficient delivery methods. And, and candies aren't, aren't allowed under the, under the law anyway. And it's going to be, it, it will be packaged in, uh, in a way that's very similar to prescription medication. So it, it's going to be packaged in a, in a, in a very medical um, capacity. And maybe you want to talk about that a little bit more. Absolutely. We haven't. Uh, fully decided on exactly what type of packaging we're going to go with. There's so many manufacturers out there right now and coming online each and every day, but it will be childproof. It will be labeled with the cannabinoid profile and every batch will pass the certification of specific <coughs> lab testing that's required, free of pesticides, free of heavy, a certain, uh, you know, free of heavy metals, free of uh, bacteria, fungus, etc. So there's strict guidelines on exactly how this medicine is to be tested and how it will be uh, labeled. Why? Why is it like with the ounces, with the leaves? Why don't you just do patches and pill form extract what's needed and do that? What's the purpose of smoking? And I think that's what's confusing to definitely Yeah, absolutely. Kids. Well, it has a, you know, different delivery methods have will have a different effect on the body, just like Mary just said. So, um, you know, depending on the case-by-case -case basis, a patient, like I mentioned, that may have lung cancer will absolutely stay away from vaporizers, possibly uh, any flower material that's smoked. And is that tested that there are all different methods? It changes? Each batch is tested. So but each when batch. They administrate it. Like what, when they're administrated. The, oh, we, the, when smoked and patched. And oh, there's, and there's literature out on that now. Like how it works if it bypasses the liver. If it doesn't, there's all different um, <coughs> tests and studies that have been done. And that's constantly evolving all the time. More questions? More comments? Yes. Good ma'am. Alan Budney, is currently conducting a marijuana study. It will be pertinent to this area. He is advertising for people in I don't know whether it's the Grafton area. I not I didn't <laughs> I don't know the exact area that he said where he's seeking People, but he is seeking New Hampshire residents for his study. They are finding that, yes, it possibly is effective, and they are finding the smoking pot, and they're also finding that possibly it does cause structural changes in the brain. I think that the jury is still out. I think that we will be finding much more, we'll have much more evidence, and I do appreciate the fact that many people have been helped by marijuana. However, <laughs> I still have the same concern. The kids, there is the trickle down. Ma'am, could we have your name, please? The, 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 the name of the doctor? No, 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 no. your oh, name. Carol Cole. Thank I you, Carol. All right, others? Yes. Good question and possibly a comment. Kelly Cherry, resident of Plymouth. I'm curious, how long has Sanctuary ETC been working on Plymouth as a site? That's for you, Jason, I think. How long have you been working on Plymouth as a site? Both. 
Um, how long will we even work? Well, we got our wood letter um, not more than three months ago now. So in reality, um, we did do some preliminary research prior to submitting our application in January. Um, but we really honed in on this site, I would say, within the last six weeks, eight weeks. So it's been six months, a year? No, no six, six weeks, four to six weeks we really honed in on this location. But it was legalized in the state in June of 2013. Correct. And, and with all due respect, I, I, I obviously we put in a lot of time and effort and work, and we can argue for a blue in the face about marijuana. But I guess my disappointment tonight lies in, and maybe I'm misinformed, so I apologize. I hadn't heard anything about this until Channel 9 news, and I think it was maybe two nights ago. And our council just said they just got word of it three to four weeks ago. So to me, it's just highly disappointing the process. If we're in a democratic society, society, excuse me, and this is our community, that we have absolutely no say on this moving forward. If I'm understanding that correctly, and again, I apologize if I'm not informed. Maybe there's a lot of people in this room who knew about this six weeks ago. I certainly didn't. The process, to me, is what bothers me most. Just a comment. Thank you. Others? Can someone explain, does this need town approval or does it not need town I'm sorry, I didn't understand. I didn't hear you. Jennifer Stewart, does this yep. need town approval or does it not need town approval? Uh, it needs a site plan review approval. And the hearing on that is Thursday night. And the planning board's usual process, as I understand it, is to look at the site plan review application. <coughs> they determine whether or not it's complete. In other words, that all of the required elements of the application are there. If they determine that it's complete, um, they accept it. Once they accept it, they look at it and determine whether or not they're going to approve it. If, in the course of their deliberation, they decide that they want additional information or they want clarification about something, they would ask for that. Some of, those, some of that information could be provided at that meeting. Maybe some of that information would have to be gathered and brought to another meeting. So it could, at least in theory, go on for a while. Uh, but what it requires is site plan review application. Um, the zoning ordinance does not <coughs> prohibit it, so far as I know. Um, so, Dr. Ebner. Joe Ebner from Plymouth. What experience does Sanctuary ATC have in running medical marijuana dispensaries? Hey, my name is Dr. David Sarek, and I'm board <coughs> certified anatomic clinical pathologist. Um, so what is your concern, basically, that there's just not enough information regarding medical cannabis? Well, I just think our community is asking for education and wanting to know what experience this entity has in setting up a dispensary and reaching out to protect the families and the youth, educating patients, educating providers. And so yeah, I'm just curious to know. Yeah, definitely education is going to be a big part of what we do. Um, I really want to travel around and discuss medical cannabis and the endocannabinoid system too. Many physician and groups, youth groups, we want to listen to. Um, as you know, you know, medical cannabis has been used therapeutically for over 5,000 years, um, and it's only only the recent 20 years where the endocannabinoid system. A lot of research has come out on the endocannabinoid system of the human body, and really, um, that's what we're learning now of how uh, the plant works in our body. And there is a lot, a lot of research out on that. Not not necessarily in the United States, but other countries where they're much more progressive. Um, have a lot of research on how cannabis is very um, effective therapeutically in numerous disease conditions. Um, so that's going to be my goal, to really reach out to the community with the knowledge <coughs> I have um, and help fill in the hole there and to really educate people. So there is a lack of, uh, so there's not too much trepidation regarding medical cannabis. Um, that's kind of my take on that. Yes? Oh, sorry. That's okay. No, that's okay. Oh, well, just one year, one year, nine. So what experience does Sanctuary ATC have and experience in setting up dispensaries? Well, I've actually done a lot of training online over the last four or five years. I've done my own endocannabinoid training, um, Cannabis Training University. Um, I've ta I'm taking a course on the um, Institute of Cannabis, Medical Cannabis, which is actually a CME physician level course, which is very intense regarding treatment options, the various distributions of the cannabinoids. Um, 
I'm taking that now. And just like I said, I've, I've, I've been doing a lot of reading in the last year, at least three or four years regarding cannabis, and how it really is therapeutically effective with all these things we are talking about. Um, it's not just bogus. And I recommend, you know, uh, Medical Cannabis Institute for yourself, take a look at go take a look at the course catalog. And it's it's amazing. It's really true science. It's not bogus, it's not anecdotal. Um, and I think you'll be surprised what you find in the endocannabinoid system because this is where things are moving now. It's no longer anecdotal. We're actually getting scientific based medicine, you know, based on true <coughs> studies that are showing this is this is medicine, this is good for people. Okay, it's no longer just, you know, well, it's probably it's no longer, longer, but I guess it's no longer it's teaching strong. Um, yeah, one at a time. Still, yeah, it's I no guess longer teaching strong. You don't have experience in setting up in another community yeah. maybe a year ago or six yeah. months ago. I, I'm assuming from your answer that we're the first for a sanctuary agency? Yes, yes. <coughs> that is correct. That is correct, yes. But I'm confident uh, moving forward um, we will have a great impact on the uh, community regarding medical cannabis. And like I said, I'd be willing to more, more the educate the community. I go to the youth centers if I need to. Um, that would be an honor for me to try to educate people and really let them understand that this, you know, medical cannabis is here. It's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Um, physicians need to kind of open up their mind to it. And um, really, I think it's a disservice for their patients if they're not offering um, patients something that can really benefit them instead of a, a pill, a pharmaceutical, which can be highly addictive. Uh, oh side effects. Uh, where cannabis has minimal side effects and no overdose because you know the brainstem has no cannabinoid receptor, so that's why you can't overdose on, on cannabis. It's just a legal. Folks. Listen yeah. to the state. It's not legal. Okay, legal folks. Legal, but not less One at a time. And this is medicine. We're not talking recreational. You guys that eat that out of your head, it's Folks, uh, let's try to do one person at a time. I, I wonder um, if I could uh, just uh, all right, Mary. Add, add a little comment here. Uh, because this is a uh, newly legal process in New Hampshire, and because the New Hampshire law requires it to be a New Hampshire charitable profit, each of the three entities for the chief, four geographic uh, areas are new legal entities, and so they won't have set up uh, an ATC in another uh, community here in New Hampshire. However, I will say the background of the different uh, boards and uh, experiences of the uh, CEO uh, and their cultivation background uh, for each of the four speaking broadly, I know you want to ask about sanctuary, was something that was reviewed during the selection process at the department, which was a competitive and uh, uh, scored process. Uh, but I would now like to give Sanctuary an opportunity to answer more specifically to you a little bit about Sanctuary and what Sanctuary has to offer in terms of their background. Is that something you sure. could speak to, Jason? Absolutely. Um, my background is heavy, whoops, sorry, John. Uh, my background is in the hedge fund indus industry, okay. and it's very heavy, as you know, on SEC and FINRA rules, and I'm very uh, structured and organized as far as compliance goes. That's really the spoke of my, you know, where I come into play. We have our master grower in the audience here who's been growing for over 12 years now, legally, in the state of Maine, hmm. and she knows precisely and exactly what she's doing. And I have full confidence in every member of our team. We have another medical do uh, doctor on our board. We have an executive from a healthcare um, operation. I mean, we have some really excellent people that comprise Sanctuary ATC and make up our board. So, yeah, like I mentioned, the National Cannabis Institute um, offers every, I believe, every two years a seminar that is sort of the three days, and it is very informative. Um, you can actually go to the website and check out some of this information. It's wonderful. Very informative, um, cutting-edge technology. Um, and there's a lot of other conferences out there offered as well. 
Um, there's a business summit that Josh and I went to in Colorado, very informative. It was a business summit, but amazing minds out there, really the cutting edge industry out there. Um, so the, the information's out there. It's, um, finding it's pretty easy. You can Google it, actually. Medical, medical cannabis conferences, and it's out there for you. Um, there's a lot of good online courses you can take as well. Um, so the information is there if you need it, and it's, it's very informative. Uh, for this past November, Dr. Oh. Hitchcock uh, provided a uh, seminar yeah. regarding uh, the therapeutic uses of cannabis, uh, and people came from across the country to uh, attend that uh, symposium at, at Dartmouth Hitchcock, and the state was there as a member in the audience listening as well. So we have some expertise in the state as well. Um, folks, probably to correct something I said before or to add to it, maybe uh, Mike Ahern would like to say something. Yeah. Mike, Ahern. Mike is. Well, you can say it. I'm the planning board chair for the town of Plymouth. There's three of our members of the board here tonight. And I do want to make it clarified there is a meeting Thursday night. We will be talking about a site plan, which uh, Mr. Conklin talked about. In that site plan review, we're going to be talking about lighting, parking, traffic. We are not going to be discussing the issues that have been going on tonight. We're not talking about the law. We're not going to be talking about whether it's appropriate for the community, um, whether it should be used medically or not. Strictly site plan review. That's the only thing that we're going to be charged with on Thursday night. Yes, ma'am. I'm Carol Gunner. I uh, I'm concerned with diversion to the youth as well. I worked the past two summers in the Parks and Recreation and have collaborated with the youth center. And I'm just concerned that once it is in the household, what is being done to educate the patients and the people receiving this medication about correct use and storage of such treatments so that these children are not able to access them. Well, that did sound like a question. Well, I think that uh, the ATCs are required under the regulations to have an educational component as part of their uh, services that they provide. And uh, perhaps Jason can talk about the educational components that Sanctuary is going to uh, be offering. And I think we've also heard from Katie and uh, other organizations that wish to provide their input as well. And I can say that I'm sure Sanctuary, as well as the state, will be uh, listening and working with those groups because uh, the state, and I'm sure Sanctuary, wants this to be a successful uh, implementation, and by that we mean something that is limited to its appropriate use, uh, in which uh, diversion is um, uh, guarded against at all uh, levels. Um, well, as Mary mentioned, and as we've, oops, sorry, and as we've said earlier, we it can't control everything or much of anything that happens at the household. That's really going to be patient responsibility. How are we going to educate people on practices that can maybe lock up medications and things of that nature? Um, I look forward to working with Katie and some of the other groups there and maybe developing better ideas other than just a child-proof package. Um, a common place that might be the best storage point oh, in a household, no, like things of that nature. Um, and anyone's input on ideas and thoughts on how to make this a better program for everybody. Neil, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah I have, uh, actually I have three questions uh, for the Sanctuary ATC. My first question is, I, I understand this is a retail operation. Uh, what is your business plan if you do not generate enough revenue to finance your operations? Well, as you know, uh, the banking situation at this point in the country, there are no loans allowed, so to speak, as to run one of these operations. It is very capital intensive, and usually how ATCs do it is uh, through investment, so to speak, either investors, but in our case, we're going to self-fund. So if... Uh, if uh, you don't generate enough revenue to continue, uh, you're out of business. We've you just go out of business? I'm sorry? You just go out of business? No, I, I don't think we're going to go you out just, of business. 
we you know, have, well, we have the, that was a hypothetical. Okay. <laughs> I, my, second, my second question uh, concerns uh, diversion. Um, is it possible for law enforcement to get samples of cannabis to uh, do genetic comparisons from your from your uh, <coughs> from your where you get your material? Um, Selectman MacGyver, the uh, handling of the cannabis is very tightly regulated, and samples uh, will not be going to any entity other than that specified by law. But there are laboratory <coughs> testing, and that is permitted. But we um, would not be handing out, allowing the handling out of, of samples other than uh, <coughs> strictly permitted uh, by law. But it doesn't mean that the uh, ATC can't do its own genetic testing and uh, certainly other laboratory testing to ensure quality and uh, the absence of uh, well, prohibited substances will be done. I'm, I'm concerned that law enforcement authorities be able to get samples to do comparison testing. Um, I think that would be up to the to the state lab and not really law enforcement. I mean, I think we would just be, what I'm hearing from you, we would just be the mechanism to bring it to the state lab anyway um, and have them test it. And I don't know if it's the state that the state lab that's going to be regulating the testing there or not. I don't know the answer to that uh, question. They will be uh, laboratories that have to be licensed under state law, but it won't be the state lab itself. Uh, and the testing and uh, handling of this material is tightly prescribed and uh, you probably wouldn't want a, an individual law enforcement officer uh, taking a role in the testing anyhow I don't think. I'm, I'm concerned about prosecution. Could you elaborate? If we have cases of diversion and we want to prove where it came from are we going to be able to match it up with the source? I think, um, and, and probably uh, Chief, our, our police chief here can talk about prosecutions for diversion. We do have uh, criminal laws that, that prohibit diversion. Um, and uh, to do genetic tests back might not be the ideal method. It would probably be more law enforcement traditional techniques about uh, following the, the trail of evidence. Um, uh, to know that a particular um, specimen came from a particular lab is not going to necessarily tell you where, uh, where there was a breakdown in the process. What the state laws and regulations will do, and uh, I will also say the ATC is required to work very closely with law enforcement, and that's actually part of our regulations that they do that, and those conversations have been occurring. Uh, but the, the place where diversion is uh, addressed is by the uh, intensive security around how um, cannabis is handled from the moment that it is first grown, how uh, inventory is uh, tracked, how inventory is checked, how uh, every person who works as an agent or volunteer has a criminal background check that's performed, and uh, multiple security systems, video systems, video uh, camera systems. Uh, it is that kind of um, approach that, uh, and I have uh, probably not elaborated on, uh, on the many different uh, security. Uh, John, would you add to some of the security uh, provisions um, because I'm probably not mentioning them all there there is a list in our I'm regulations satisfied. okay I'm, I don't want to overwhelm you with I, too many words yeah. so I, I have one more question um, does uh, sanctuary AT cooperate with Katie and other uh, youth organization groups in the town absolutely without question thank you thank you and, and I will just add to that that the state will reach out to Katie as well to bring them in on the ground level at, at a state level. Thank you. John? Yes. Um, those that are using the medical marijuana that are smoking, um, you know, what, what can be the effect of if you've got children in the house or 
I mean, you know, if it's isolated and they smoke there, what can be the, or, or is there any impact? I don't know. I'm not well, that. You always with secondhand smoke. I mean, even with the regular cigarettes, you worry about secondhand smoke and the yeah. rest of carcinogens that way. We hope that with cannabis, whoever is smoking in that house would have the common sense to go and use it there without exposing their children or anyone else in the room. I mean, that, that's a big concern. Good point with that, too. But, you know, that's, once again, that can't be really policed by us. That's going to be a common sense thing on the patient when they get home. And if they're smoking, where should I do this so that no one else uh, gets secondhand smoke? That's a good point. One of the things that we learned when we went to the uh, dispensary in Connecticut is that fewer and fewer patients nationwide who are having access to therapeutic cannabis are, are smokable form. When the therapeutic cannabis programs you know, early on got started, that was the most common means of, of utilizing it. But over time, people are gravitating more, and more to other means, such as patches and, and salves and, and away from, from smoking. And, and the, the expectation soon is that, that it'll be a large majority of, of patients who are using it in forms other than smoking. And when, uh if someone is using um, cannabis for the therapeutic impact and they're burning it, they're losing a lot of the product into the air. So that is one of the reasons why some of these uh, dispensaries are moving more to these other uh, delivery methods. Okay. Bill, did you? Yeah, so uh, I've got a question um, regarding, um, you know, if everything gets in place and uh, the planning board um, accepts your application, and the certifying physicians are, you know, uh, ramped up. Uh, what's the end? Hearing you, sir. I, I'm saying if um, everything is put in place as far as um, the certifying physicians, the um, the planning board application, and I was just wondering when, um, you know, like a target of when you're going to be like ramping up to actually open. I would say broadly the first quarter of next year. Our our goal is to be open and uh, distributing medicine to qualified patients in January. Is that, uh, that's going to be a push, but I think it's achievable. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay, Laurie Ebner, uh, it's 8 o'clock. We've been here for two hours discussing this. Do the people of our town, of our community, have anything to say about whether this is going to happen or not because if not i'll go home and put the kids to bed but if if we have some input and if we have any anything to say about it at all i'd like for us to know it sounds like the planning board is only going to discuss the site and the specifics of the site is there anything else do we have any other recourse <laughs> A warrant article, is that correct, would be the one recourse you might Who said have? that? It's this yeah. gentleman over here. This Can gentleman. I elaborate? Um, yeah. That's exactly. Uh, what I proposed to Epic, um, he, all I needed to do was go to the, the planning board to get the site survey. What they did was they, they then created a warrant article that lumped ATCs in with the methadone clinics and pushed it off to the little industrial corner of, of the town, and then they passed that. But if I, um, but that kicked in when it was voted in by the people. But before that, there was no recourse to stop an ATC from going in because there was no controlling warrant article that actually banned um, an ATC from the town. Maureen, I think he's talking about uh, an amendment to the zoning ordinance that, in his case, lumped it in with something you know something else um, so, but that would so this is coming essentially and we don't have there's nothing really we can do about it because it's here and the government has said that it's, we've got to set it up somewhere is that what we're getting at pretty much are you going to try to sugarcoat it, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know sugar in the house. Um, 
actually, the, the, the rationale is that the legislature has acted to to pass the law. Sorry, can you start over? Sure. It's not the yeah, That's that's not that's live, Jack. I'll yell. Yeah. The legislature has acted to pass a law. We all know that. We've discussed this for the last two hours. The next step in the process is the planning board uh, discuss this on Thursday, but it's not the same level of approach. The planning board is charged by law with certain responsibilities ordinance, under the planning ordinances to see if, in fact, a particular use qualifies in that particular zone. It's very limited. It's nuts and bolts, as Mike has said, and Mike has said, very nuts and bolts. So if you're asking, is there the ability to have the town reject the notion of medical marijuana? I think the answer is clearly no. Uh, that ship has sailed, uh, for better or for worse. But the point is, the planning process is to treat people equally and fairly across the board, whether you like their shop or not. So we're looking to have a fair planning process, uh, giving us the same considerations any business, any legal business in Plymouth, New Hampshire. This hearing tonight, was to have all these discussions in the emotion and the perspective. But the next hearing is far more nuts and bolts in nature. If that's incorrect? No, I, I do agree with you. And uh, uh, that is a true statement that the legislature has passed a, uh, a process that uh, looks at the local community and uh, has put certain limitations in, such as <coughs> it may not be located within a certain distance of uh, drug-free school zone, that uh, that it not be within a residential area, uh, that there be a public input hearing such as we're having tonight that allows uh, individuals, patients, qualifying patients, caregivers, and residents to come forward and express their concerns and uh, the ATC can hear them and respond to them. It, it, it's a process established by law and, and it is as described. Um, you know my what? My understanding well. is that the uh, public hearing was supposed to be during the application process. And so why did we get three days notice after it's already been chosen to be here? They have not yet uh, applied for their registration. Uh, the actual statute says uh, that public input will be considered uh, with a registration. The registration is due August 27. Entities applied to DHHS for uh, selection. That was um, a uh, process established by which it, it is, uh, there were 14 entities that came in and said, these are our qualifications. They answered a request for application process that was very detailed and laid out. And in that uh, process, they did not pick a particular location. Uh, they said which geographic area they would like to be considered for. Some of them uh, may have indicated that they were inclined to one particular uh, area as opposed to another. But uh, in other words, uh, this is the right time for that. This is the time that the law has specified to have that hearing, and, and that is why we are doing it now. It wouldn't be, as a practical matter, it wouldn't be possible to have a, a public input meeting with the town until we knew where the, uh, the ATC intended to locate. And which of the 14 was going to be selected, otherwise there would have been hearings all across the state by entities that might not be selected. So it would not have been uh, a useful process, nor was it a process that the law required. You know, uh, yes sir. Yeah, I, I would like to comment. I was going to shut my mouth tonight, but I was one of the applicants that spent a lot of money in a different area to do this. And I want to read you guys something here that is part of 126F, which is the law, okay? It talks about what we have to do with the minimum. By the way, I've tried a specific building with specific zoning. So, hold, on that just, just my location. hold on a second. Can I just read? Because no, this, what this is thing isn't name? true. Listen to me. What okay, is my your name? name? One more set. Okay, and I apply. Okay, let me read to you. Whoa, 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 whoa. How much are you going to read? Because that thing goes on. Well, well, two sentences. Two sentences. All right. This two is sentences. what 126 steps. What's required? Okay. At any time, one or more alternative treatment center registration applications are being considered. When there's one or more, 
okay, when it was 14. The department shall, in partnership with the local governing body, the town or city where the alternative treatment center would be located, solicit input from qualifying patients, designated caregivers in the resident town and city in which an alternative treatment center would be located. This is part of section 126X7, which is the alternative treatment centers. And, and, and let me just read one sentence. The alternative treatment center application supporting materials shall include at a minimum. So I disagree, and when I applied, I planned on going to meetings at, at all the different towns, including mine, that would have let you consider this and talk about it before it was actually done. And in fact, what's the point of having a meeting after the decision's already made? So people can just come in and complain like they're doing tonight? This was supposed to be done before. The thing is, it's supposed to be done by August 27th. That's in 10 days. 10 days, they're supposed to have the building, the building permit, the layouts of the interior of the building, all that. And on WMUR's site, Today, I was looking at it, and Mr. Martin's on there, the gentleman up here, and he's stating that basically that maybe they're not going to make it, and what they're going to do is extend the deadline, which, which was what got me to come to this meeting, because when I applied, I assumed the state was going to adhere to the deadlines and their rules, which I won't give you my opinion, but um, uh, you know, I wanted to speak my mind so everybody would understand why you're coming here, and your input isn't making a difference whether this, this should be accepted. So I would simply respond on behalf of the state if I, if I might. You might. Okay, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, we respectfully disagree with uh, the legal analysis. We had a, uh, a team of individuals, including. Uh, Can you stand up and speak a little louder. Okay, uh, pardon me. I'll speak louder. Uh, the department respectfully disagrees with Mr. Morissette's analysis. Um, for the reasons that we've earlier described. Uh, I know Mr. Morissette uh, deeply wished to be uh, an, a selected entity and, and uh, is frustrated that he was not selected. I, I understand that he had a deep conviction and wished to have that role, and, and I understand that disappointment. However, that is not the law. We respectfully disagree with you that the law did not require uh, public input uh, and, and all of the uh, communities around uh, the state, particularly when you consider that the application process itself was confidential and no one was allowed to speak about it w while it was ongoing and nor could the department talk about the merits of any of the particular entities that were applying that were going through a confidential uh, review process. It, it, it's just not a process uh, that uh, would be appropriate, nor was it one that uh, the law required. Uh, I do respectfully understand that Mr. Morissette does not agree and that he's, that he's disappointed, so. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, Kate, you've had your hand up intermittently. I'm Katie Hedberg, I'm a resident of Plymouth. I just want to voice my disappointment that we have a public hearing that really means nothing. Um, very little good information was given. We know the medical director had training online. There is no public input. We can say anything we want, but it really doesn't make a difference. And I'm really disappointed in both the state. I have no vested interest one way or another um, in my comments here. I just think that this is not really for public input. I appreciate the select board um, is in a position that they're hosting this, but it really makes no difference what anyone here in the room has to say, which is disappointing to me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is just a request, I guess, of DHHS, Mary. Um, as you know, healthcare is highly regulated, and your hospitals and practices are providing data frequently about quality metrics. And we don't have to get into the specifics today, but I think the state's uh, CMO group that meets with what DHHS expects from a quality metric. We heard today that in Connecticut they're moving towards transplants <coughs> and pills and not getting away from the smoking pill. Is there benchmark data on how many of the prescriptions are smoked versus patch? So that if you're an outlier versus other a, um, dispensaries, <coughs> that can be um, addressed to be more safer modes of delivery. 
So I guess I'm asking maybe if the DHHS could consider what kind of quality metrics and reporting with the state uh, and the medical board we could, we could get in the future. Uh, yes. I just have to go into detail here because it's not uh, Absolutely, it's completely understood. There is the Therapeutic Advisory Council, which is a legislative uh, body that includes the medical board, it includes uh, the nursing board, it includes uh, uh, a number of uh, health entities that have law enforcement is on that board. There's a number of entities that have a voice at that, and one of the issues for them to consider is the quality issues. Uh, also, uh, the New Hampshire Medical uh, Society uh, has an interest in this topic as, as well and has had some meetings about this. So I, I welcome uh, your participation and any of your associates' participation, and uh, we could take up this conversation outside of this meeting. <clears throat> Mike Ager and Planning Board Chair, I wanted to clarify a point that the gentleman here with the blue shirt said that uh, the townspeople wanted to, they could put to, put forth a warrant article. Well, a warrant article probably, uh, I believe, would happen in March. Uh, this application has already been applied, so it would it might be able to do something for a second <laughs> facility, but it would do nothing for the application that's in front of the Planning Board on Thursday. Just be careful about giving legal opinions. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Not even Jack. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the door. All right. I will. Uh, unless I see a hand really quick, I'm going to close this public hearing. Public hearing. Oh, thank you. Good. Well, that was sort of post gavel there. <laughs> but, all right, we'll catch you a little soon. Sir Michael Bouchard, I purchased Penny Mountain. I love this community. I spent five years studying this area before I purchased this mountain. I recently purchased it. I'm really disappointed in the state for not letting us know or having a better process to bring it to our attention. I represent hundreds of millions of dollars of investment money that's coming into this community. I have to go back and explain to them now. What's going on? And I don't. I, I don't know how to explain it to them because the people outside this community that are going to come up here and use this activity area that we're building up, and we spend so much time. And I just want to say that it's not the community. I love the Plymouth. I'm just disappointed in the state. It is too fast of a process, and there's a lot of other developments around that that are depending on what we're doing. And we had to choose two other states to go to. So when you say that you you did your studies and everything everywhere for your um, medical studies of people, you have to remember it's an economic study that has to be done too. It affects all of us. That's it. Thank you. Now, I'm not, who's waving the hand over there? <laughs> oh, okay. Very <laughs> <laughs> slow. Two hours and 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs>